Hello and welcome to this video where I'm going to be talking about a very interesting topic. Um, that is ritual impurity in the Old Testament. Um, I'm not, I'm specifically going to be going over all the different things you could do in the Old Testament that would make you ritually impure and specifically why they make you ritually impure and what that means uh, sort of theologically and all that. Um, and before I begin though, I just want to make it clear that when we're talking about ritual impurity, we're talking about things that are not sinful. Okay, the things we're going to be going over, they are not sinful, but they are ritually impure. Okay, there's a very important difference between things that are sinful, like murder, and things that are ritually impure, like um, having sex, as we'll see. Um, because ritual impurity is uh, something that most Israelites had to regularly engage in just to go about their daily lives. Um, it was necessary to become ritually impure at certain points. All it meant is that you're not allowed to interact with holy things, such as the tabernacle, or you're not allowed to interact with things within the sanctuary. Um, and so it's just very important to understand that when we're talking about ritual impurity, we are not talking about things that are sins. Um, and, uh, and so yeah, so let's just get right into it. I think I'm going to start off talking about the things that make you ritually impure by uh, talking about something that does not make you ritually impure. And this is just something that gets brought up a lot in discussions with liberal Christians or atheists or whoever else is just wondering about this. And this is the topic of mixed fabrics. So in Leviticus 19.19, um, we read, quote, Keep my decrees, do not mate different kinds of animals, do not plant your field with two kinds of seeds, and do not wear clothing woven of two kinds of material. Um, and a lot of people, they get confused by this, they don't really know what it means, like why are you not allowed to wear mixed fabrics, does this law still apply to us, um, and you know, is this a moral law, or what have you, and the answer to that, is it a moral law, is obviously no, it's not a moral law. Um, in fact, this, as is obvious from the quote, this comes in a series of laws about keeping things apart. So you're not to make two different kinds of animals. You're not to mix two different kinds of seeds, okay? You're just, and you're not to mix two different kinds of fabric. This is symbolic of the distinction between Jew and Gentile. And so this is to show that the Jews are to be set apart from the Gentiles, and they are not to mix with the Gentiles, okay? This is why when... Christ appears to St. Peter in Acts 10 and tells him, in the context of cleansing the Gentiles, you shall not call common what God has cleansed. And he's talking about uh, ritually impure food, and but that's also linked to the Gentiles because um, all of the most, or specifically in this case and with some of the foods that we'll see, these things are in place ritually to show the distinction between Jew and Gentile. And since in the church there is no longer a distinction between Jew and Gentile, uh, because there is neither Greek nor Jew, but all are one in Christ Jesus, as St. Paul says, uh, this is why the law no longer applies. But we further know that mixed, but it doesn't just end there. Because some people, they just end the discussion there, but it actually goes deeper than this. And this is because mixed fabrics, as I mentioned earlier, they do not make you ritually impure, but rather mixed fabrics are holy. Because as I mentioned, it's symbolic of the mixture of Jew and Gentile. So Jews and Gentiles coming together is what mixed fabrics uh, symbolizes. And so this is actually holy because throughout the Old Testament, we see prophecies about the Jews and the Gentiles coming together as one people, coming together in the church. Um, we see this, for example, I, I did an entire video about this called The Church's Conquest of the Nations, where I go over this in more detail. If you'd like to watch that, I'll link in the description. Um, but to suffice it to say that mixed fabrics are eschatological. They are symbolic of the age to come, and this is why it is only the high priest who is allowed to wear mixed fabrics. And so it's not that uh, wearing mixed fabrics makes you ritually impure, but it's that mixed fabrics are set aside specifically for the high priest. Okay, and we see this in Exodus 28 and Exodus 39, where um, God is describing the priestly garments 
that the Israelites are to make, and he says that they are to be of one piece with the uh, ephod and made with gold and with blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and with finely twisted linen. So yarn and linen, those are two different fabrics that are coming together to form one priestly garment. And like I mentioned, this is symbolic of the fact that the high priest is eschatological because the high priest embodies the entire nation of Israel and the high priest also represents God. This is why we call Christ the true high priest because it is in him, sorry about that, it is in him that the Jews and Gentiles come together. And so this was, be oh, sorry about that again. Um, and so this was being symbolized in the person of the high priest in the Old Testament. So I just thought I'd throw that in there because a lot of people, they, they, they don't realize that. That mixed fabrics, they're not bad, they're not impure, they're certainly not immoral, but rather they are eschatological. They are symbolic of what is to come, or at least what was to come in the time of the Israelites. Obviously, we are currently living in the eschatological age where Jew and Gentile live together in the church. And so that, that is one of the many reasons why that law no longer applies because it has been fulfilled through Christ. Not nullified, but its meaning has been fulfilled. Um, so with that said, let's get into some actually ritually impure things. And the first one I'm I want to go over is a major theme you'll see throughout these uh, ritual impurities, and this is death. So in uh, Numbers 19, we read that whoever touches a human corpse will be unclean for seven days. This is the law that applies when a person dies in a tent. Anyone who enters the tent and anyone who is in it will be unclean for seven days. And every open container without a lid fastened on it will be unclean. So as we can see, death is very unclean because not only does touching a dead corpse make you impure, but even just standing in the same room as a dead corpse makes not only you impure, but also any... Uh, open container. So if something's in a container and it doesn't have a lid on it and it's in the same room as a dead body, well guess what? Now it's impure and you can't touch it for seven days. Um, so obviously death is very, very impure. It's one of the most impure things you can be in the Old Testament. And, uh, and so why is this the case? Well, this is the case because, as I'm going to be arguing throughout this video, what makes something ritually impure is when it is something that was instituted after the fall. And so all things that make you ritually impure are in some way associated with the curses of Genesis chapter 3, where we have the fall of Adam and Eve, as well as the curse of the serpent. Um, and so this is what the uh, rituals of the Old Testament are modeled after. They're modeled after you are to avoid things that are associated with the curses of Genesis 3. Because the curses of Genesis 3, they are the curses of the covenant. Because with every covenant, you have blessings and you have curses. And the curse of the Adamaic covenant in Genesis 3 was a variety of things. It was, and one of, and those, uh, the most important of those obviously was death. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. And obviously the serpent was also cursed, which is significant as we'll see. And then the woman had specific curses, um, specifically with regard to birth pains, which we'll also see show up in the laws uh, as well. And uh, this, this makes sense of another law that some people find rather strange, uh, but it actually makes perfect sense when we think of it in this context. And so in Leviticus 21, um, we read that... Uh, Priests are not allowed to ritually mourn their wives. Okay, this some people find this very strange. They say, like, you know, I, I think it was Elijah. Uh, I could be wrong about that. It was either Elijah or Ezekiel or Zechariah, one of those three. Um, their wife died, and he wasn't allowed to mourn her ritually. It doesn't mean he wasn't allowed to be sad, but it means he was not allowed to ritually mourn her because the high priest is the priest of the living God. And God cannot be associated with death. Things that are holy cannot be associated with death. The high priest is set aside. He is holy. And so he cannot be associated with death. Um, and so that's why the high priest is not allowed to ritually mourn his wife. He's allowed to be sad. He's just not allowed to perform a mourning ritual over her. Um, because he is to uh, keep himself away from things that are uh, death. Because they are related to the curses of Genesis 3. This also makes sense of the fact that uh, skin diseases are ritually impure. And now, this is specifically referring to biblical leprosy, but it's important to understand that leprosy in the Bible is not the same thing as leprosy today, okay? It did not make your skin fall off. It was not contagious. Um, 
but rather leprosy, as we read in Leviticus 13, um, the kind, the specific kind of leprosy that is impure, is it says the priest is to examine the sore, skin, the sore on the skin, and if the hair in the sore has turned white and the sore appears to be more than skin deep, it is a defiling skin disease. And so, defiling skin diseases are what they are thing, they are diseases that make your skin have sores and make your skin look white. And what what do those things have in common? They are features of corpses. So uh, defiling skin diseases are those that make your body look like a corpse, that make your body look like it's dead. This is why anyone who touches you becomes impure, just as anyone who touches a dead body also becomes impure. Um, and so once again, we have the association between death, the curse of Genesis 3, which is to dust you shall return, and ritual impurity. So if you associate yourself with anything related to death, even if it just looks like death, because obviously people didn't really die from this kind of leprosy. Some people probably did, but uh, most people were fine. Um, but it would just it just looked like death, and so that was enough to make it ritually impure. Um, okay, uh, the next uh, thing that makes you ritually impure is if you eat unclean animals, and so this is important because we have to understand what is an unclean animal. Um, well, we read in uh, Leviticus 11 that uh, God says, Of all the animals that live on the land, these are the ones you may eat. You may eat any animal that has a divided hoof and that chews the cud, and whatever crawls on its belly, and whatever walks on all fours, whatever has many feet in respect to every swarming things that swarms on the earth, you shall not eat them, for they are detestable. Okay, so what's going on here? So these are unclean animals. So in order to be an unclean animal, you have to um, not have a hoof, not have a divided hoof. Um, you have to not chew the cud, and you have to uh, crawl in the ground or swarm in the air. Okay, and so what do these things all have in common? Well, they are all directly related to the curses of Genesis 3. Because what do we see in... Um, Genesis 3, we see that the ground is cursed. There's a curse that is put on the ground. And so what are hoofs on an animal? They are shoes. They protect the animal's feet from the cursed ground. This is why when Moses was on holy ground in Exodus 3 uh, verse 5, he removes his shoes because on holy ground you do not need shoes, but on cursed ground you do need shoes. And so this is a direct reference to the cursing of the ground in Genesis 3. So animals that do not have their feet protected are standing directly on cursed ground and then themselves become unclean. Okay, and so what's this business about chewing the cud? Well, chewing the cud, that's when you, you chew something, you spit it out, and then you chew what you spit out again. Um, this is a reference to always professing the word of God. And so this is an idea, uh, profession of faith and lip and chewing and mouth these are all very closely associated throughout the Bible, and so that's why it says, keep God on your lip all the time. Um, and specifically in Ezekiel 3, um, the movement of the mouth is very closely associated with the profession of faith. And the idea basically is that you chew on the law of the Lord. This is a symbol of meditating on the law of the Lord, as the Psalms talk about. So you take in the law of the Lord, it comes out of you, and then you take it in again, and you digest it, you meditate on it more. And so uh, if animals do that, then they are clean. If they don't, then they are impure. Um, and then we have swarming animals and animals that crawl in the dust or crawl on the ground. They crawl on their belly. Well, what is that? That's obviously direct reference to the serpent. The serpent was cursed to crawl on his belly, to eat dust. And then the swarming is a reference to, um, to demons, because throughout the Old Testament, we see, and also the New Testament, we see this, I believe, in the book of Isaiah, and in Revelation 18, I believe, we see that there is a connection between unclean birds and demons. And so unclean birds are images of demons that they swarm around you and they try to attack you. They try to eat you. Um, this is actually what we see happen in later on in Genesis when Abram is delivering a sacrifice to God. There is an unclean bird that tries to come and eat his sacrifice and he has to ward it off. Um, and there are a lot of literary parallels between that and uh, the book of in Genesis 2 through 3. But I won't go into that right now, at least in this video. 
Um, but it is just interesting to note. So we see that unclean animals in the Old Testament are associated with the serpent of Genesis 3 and the cursing of the ground in Genesis 3. So once again, we have this direct correlation between the purity laws of Leviticus and the curses that come from the Adamaic covenant. Um, and, so the, and then likewise, obviously, if, a, if an Israelite eats one of these animals who are associated with the serpent or with the curses in Genesis 3, then they become ritually impure. Now, the last thing, or one of the last things I'll mention about ritual impurity is one of the more controversial aspects of this, and this is the fact that anything associated with sex makes you ritually impure. Um, and so, for example, in Leviticus 15, we read that when any man has an unusual bodily discharge, uh, such a discharge is unclean. When a man has an emission of semen, he must bathe his whole body with water, and he will be unclean till evening. And likewise, when a man has sexual relations with a woman and there is an emission of semen, both of them must bathe with water and they will be unclean till evening. Okay, um, so what's going on here? So this is actually the foundation of the patristic doctrine that there was no sex before the fall. Um, if you read through the Church Fathers, they are pretty much unanimous about this. For example, St. Augustine wrote that, at the very least, he wrote that uh, sex before the fall was dispassionate. Um, it did not have the same lustful characteristics that it does today. Um, Saint Maximus the Confessor explicitly says that sexual intercourse did not exist, or sexual procreation did not exist before the fall. Saint John of Damascus explicitly says this as well. Um, and you see this throughout many fathers in one way or another. Some of them will say that it existed in some form, some of them will say that it just didn't exist at all. Um, but regardless, you see that there is this sort of skeptical attitude towards sexual relations coming from the church fathers. And now a lot of modern liberal scholars, liberal Christians, they like to just say, well, you know, the church fathers, they were just stuck up, you know, they were monastics, they didn't really know what they're talking about, they were just imposing Platonism on Christianity. But no, we see that this idea that sex is unclean actually comes directly from Leviticus. And as I've mentioned before, Throughout this video, what do all the laws in Leviticus, Numbers, uh, Deuteronomy, what do they all have in common is they are all things that were instituted after the fall. Okay, so the serpent is cursed after the fall. The ground is cursed after the fall. Man is cursed to die after the fall. And these are all things that uh, make you ritually impure in the Old Testament. And so what does this tell you about sexual relations? If sexual relations make you ritually impure, what does that mean? It means that these things came after the fall. So we see that sexual relations were instituted after the fall. It's right here in Leviticus. It's not an imposition from Platonism. It's not just, um, you know, something that St. Augustine came up with because he had bad experiences with sex as a young child. Um, no, this is right here in, in the Bible. And why is sex impure? Well, because we learn in Psalm 50 that we are conceived in iniquity. Okay, the fathers almost unanimously read this as saying that original sin is passed down through sexual relations. And so when you were conceived in iniquity, that's not just a metaphor, that is literal. From the moment of your conception, you know, obviously as Leviticus 15 says, um, when a man has sexual relations with a woman and there is an emission of semen, so it's implying that there is concept a conception happening, um, then that is impure. That is impure because original sin is being transmitted. And once again, this is a pretty much unanimous patristic teaching. Even St. Gregory Palamas teaches this. Um, and you find this in many fathers. St. Athanasius, St. Gregory of Nyssa. It's throughout the patristic literature, and this is not a foreign imposition of the Bible. It's right here from the Old Testament text. Um, and so I just thought that that's a very important thing to note. And so, but then again, this may raise the question, well, okay, if there were no sexual relations before the fall, then why does God tell Adam and Eve in Genesis 2 to be fruitful and multiply? Well, there are a few answers you come up with to this. St. Augustine basically said that, well, you know, something analogous to sex still existed before the fall. St. John of Damascus said this a similar thing. Um, and so the basic way that I would think about it is the same way that death relates before and after the fall. So before the fall, there is no death, obviously. But there is something that is like 
death, before the fall. As I've mentioned on my blog before, um, in Genesis chapter 2, Adam is put into a deep sleep. Okay, the, word, the term deep sleep here is a very unusual word. It's only used twice in the whole Torah. And it refers to a death sleep. So Adam is literally, in a, in a certain sense, he's put to death. And then what happens immediately after he's put to death, he is divided in half. His side is taken from him. And so he is asleep and he is divided. And then obviously he awakes and then he sees his bride right by his side. And we know that this is talking about death because when Jesus' resurrection is described in the Gospels, it's said that he is he wakes up, he's awoken, and then the church, his bride, is by his side, which is represented by the, the women coming to the tomb. And so, but this was a non-violent form of death. It was an incorrupt form of death. Okay, but then obviously after the thaw, you had the introduction of a corrupt form of death. Um, and so I think this is analogous to sex. So before the fall, you have an incorrupt version of sex that allows for the reproduction of humans. So humans can be fruitful, multiply, and fulfill God's command in a non-sinful, non-corrupt way. Uh, and then after the fall, you have corrupted sexual relations. This is the argument of St. Maximus and St. John of Damascus um, is th just this point that the passions of lust that uh, are introduced in the sexual uh, union, they did not exist before the fall, and they are actually impure. Um, and this is actually why it's very important that we believe that Christ was conceived of the Virgin Mary, the Virgin, and the Holy Spirit. So Christ was not conceived in sex, and this means he is free of all sin, including original sin. And interestingly enough, we also believe that the Virgin Mary was conceived without passion. Um, and now whether or not that means she has original sin or not is not a topic I really want to address here, but it's just interesting to note that the Virgin Mary is conceived without passion. She's still conceived in sex, but without passion, and that Jesus is conceived um, without sex. And this is actually a point that St. Augustine makes, is the fact that there's only three people we traditionally hold to be born without original sin, and this is Adam, Eve, and Jesus. And they, all three of them, what do they have in common? They have in common that they did not come into the world through sexual relations. Um, and this teaching, as I've been explaining here, comes directly from Leviticus. The fact that sexual unions are seen as impure, and specifically the discharge of semen, which implies corruption, is seen as impure, taken together with Psalm 50, where we learn that you conceived in corruption, conceived in iniquity, then we see that this is a very biblical teaching. It's not a foreign position. Um, okay, so I just want to get that out of the way. And this leads us into our last point, which is the fact that in uh, Leviticus Leviticus 12, we read that a woman who becomes pregnant and gives birth to a son will be ceremonial, un uh, ceremonially unclean for seven days, just as she is unclean during her monthly period. And then in Leviticus 15, we learn that a woman's monthly period is also uh, unclean explicitly. Specifically, it's the discharge of blood that makes her unclean. So what's going on here? Well, obviously, this gives credence to the fact that sexual procreation is something that's instituted after the fall, because even giving birth is seen as impure. Because uh, this was instituted in Genesis 3.16, where the woman is cursed to have birth pains. Okay, before the fall, there was not post-fall birth. When we think of birth, we think of a woman you know, going through pain um, and such like that. But before the fall, this was not the case. And so this is why when a woman becomes pregnant, gives birth, she is, uh, she is impure. And this is why it's so important that we believe that Mary's birth of Christ, so when Mary gave birth to Christ, uh, it was painless. So she did not have pain when she was giving birth to Christ. This is essential because this, because if this isn't the case, then this means that Christ was born into corruption. This would mean that he was born into sin. He was born in impurity. But it's very important that Christ is not born impurely. He is born without sin. Okay, and so because the birth pains of a woman are impure because they were instituted after the fall, they are instituted in Genesis 3.16 as one of the curses of the covenant, uh, this is why uh, Mary did not have birth pains when she gave birth to Christ. Because if she did, then her birth would have been impure, but obviously it was the most pure holy birth that has ever taken place in the universe. Um, 
And this teaching is not a foreign imposition, okay? This isn't just something we just came up with, but it's right here in Leviticus. This teaching comes straight from the Old Testament laws. Um, and then obviously when it comes to the, uh, the woman having her period every month, this obviously is the woman being cursed even when she's not giving birth. So, you know, obviously what is that a sign of? It's a sign that she's not pregnant. But even if a woman's not pregnant, she's still cursed with birth pains because this comes from Genesis 3. And so obviously, as I just read, Leviticus 12 directly links um, period blood to birth pains uh, from Genesis 3.16. And the reason why this is impure is because what is blood? Well, in Genesis 9.4 and Leviticus 17.11, we read that the life of the flesh is in the blood. God specifically uh, forbids Noah from eating the blood of animals because the life of the animal is in the blood. And obviously, like I just mentioned, Leviticus 17 confirms this. You're not to eat the blood of animals because the, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Uh, and this is actually why even under the new covenant we are forbidden from eating blood in acts 15 uh, verses 23 through 29 the apostles forbid the gentiles from doing three things they forbid them from having immoral sexual relations so fornication they forbid them from idolatry so uh participating in pagan sacrifices and they forbid them from eating what is strangled which is a reference to blood because when you strangle an animal, you keep its blood inside of them. You are not allowed to eat blood under the New Covenant. And this is confirmed in numerous canons of the Church, such as the Apostolic Canons, the Quinsex Council, and I'll link a, an article, a great article that was written by Father John Whiteford, down in the description about the Orthodox teaching on eating animal blood. But suffice to say that the Orthodox Church forbids the eating of animal blood. For this reason, the life of an animal is in its blood. And the life of a creature belongs to God and not to man, so you're not to consume it. And so, once this is understood, you can understand that if blood is leaving your body, what does that mean? Well, if your life is in your blood and blood is leaving your body, that means that life is literally draining out of your body. You are losing life when you lose blood. And this isn't just theological, this is also literal. Because you, there's a such thing as bleeding out. If you lose too much blood, you will die. Um, this is because your life is in your blood. And so, when a woman bleeds on her period, this is an image of life leaving her body. It's an image of death. And as we've made the point of throughout this video, anything related to death is related to the curse of Genesis 3, to dust you shall return, and thus is impure, because the impurity laws are directly related to everything that was instituted after the fall in Genesis 3. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah. I think that's going to conclude this video for now. Hopefully this isn't too long. Um, I wanted to make it relatively short, but uh, yeah, I hope you got something out of this. Um, feel free to leave a comment below if you have questions or concerns or think I messed something up. And uh, yeah, I'll see you guys next time. Bye.